Hey guys and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. I'm John and in this video we'll be talking about scientific reasoning and why science requires no belief system with some examples using the hot topic of flat earth. Let's get started. Alright, so it came to my attention that some people, especially the ones willing to believe any conspiracy theory, think that science is a belief system or a religion of sorts. So today we're going to address this by talking about how hypotheses are made in science and how conclusions are reached, as well as the strength of those conclusions. The first thing to address is that science is usually what we call technology or knowledge that results from applying the scientific method, which is simply a set of rules that helps increase the likelihood of an accurate understanding of reality. And it's also ever evolving and we actually embrace being proven wrong by other strong evidence. There are two main ways of thinking in science. One is deductive reasoning and the other is inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning has been around since Aristotle who started documenting this way of thinking in the 4th century BC. Inductive reasoning on the other hand was invented by Francis Bacon in 1620 and it was meant to challenge deductive reasoning as a way of coming to stronger conclusions. As it turns out, they're both useful and have both been adopted as the main ways of reasoning scientifically. One does not trump the other. So let's start by examining deductive reasoning and how it works. Deductive reasoning starts with a general premise or hypothesis and adds as many premises as needed and they become more and more specific until finally a conclusion is reached. This kind of reasoning is known as a bottom-up approach, uh, since we start with a general and become more and more specific with each premise. Uh, for a deductive argument to be valid, we need the conclusion to be true if the premises are true. For a deductive argument to be sound, it must be valid and all premises must be true. In other words, everything must be true. Here's an example of sound deductive reasoning. All men are mortal. Dan is a man, therefore Dan is mortal. The first premise here is all men are mortal. This is general, verifiable, and true, so it's a good premise to start with. Huh? The second premise is more specific, Dan is a man. This is also verifiable and true, and it has a good relationship to the first premise, so it's a good second premise to have. Huh? Then we have the conclusion that Dan is mortal. Because all the premises were true, we know that this conclusion is also true and certain. If, on the other hand, we had false premises, we would have this example of a valid but unsound deductive reasoning. All people who eat vegetables are healthy. Dan eats vegetables, therefore Dan is healthy. Here, if all people who ate vegetables were actually healthy and Dan eats vegetables, then Dan being healthy would forcibly be true. This makes it a valid argument, but valid arguments are not enough. We need sound arguments. For this argument to be sound, we would need all premises to be true. And in this case, it is not true that all people who eat vegetables are healthy. So this argument is unsound and can't be used. At this point, we have to go back and change the premises to something true before a sound conclusion can be accepted. So the benefits of using this type of reasoning is that the conclusion resulting from a sound argument will be a certainty. This requires absolutely no belief or faith because the essence of it all was just logic. Then we have inductive reasoning. The reason why inductive reasoning didn't replace deductive reasoning but instead are used alongside each other is because they don't start with the same data. We learned that with deductive reasoning, we have a bottom-up approach where we start from the general and go to the more specific, but inductive reasoning is the opposite. It goes from the specific to the general. Inductive reasoning starts with observations and data. Then we make our premises based on the data we observed. With this approach, we can gain extremely high confidence in our premises, but we can't guarantee that they're true like we can with deductive reasoning. With inductive reasoning, we might have an extreme amount of data that gives us 99.99% .99 certainty that our premises are true, but we can never call it an absolute certainty like the 100% certainty that we get from deductive reasoning. 
Therefore, inductive reasoning allows for the possibility for a conclusion to be false, even if all the premises are true. Another way to look at it is that deductive reasoning has a conclusion that is either right or wrong, while inductive reasoning has a conclusion that is either weak or strong. Here's a classic example of inductive reasoning. All of the swans we've observed are white, therefore we expect all swans to be white. With this example, we don't guarantee that the conclusion is true. Instead, we use a degree of certainty about the conclusion, and we allow ourselves to be proven wrong in the future. For example, if we only observe 10 white swans, the degree of certainty would certainly be much lower than if we had observed 10,000 white swans. In essence, deductive reasoning is about certainty, while inductive reasoning is about probability. It's worth noting at this point that these types of reasonings branch out in many different subtypes and all have their own very specific rules about how to ensure logic is applied as well as it can be. But all of them are dependent on pure logic to ensure we get the most accurate understanding of our reality with the data that we have. Another type of reasoning that's not considered to be one of the basic types but is very important to know is abductive reasoning. Abductive reasoning is about coming to a conclusion that is the best explanation based on some events. For example, if you come back home and see all your trash scattered all over the floor and your dog has the trash can lid struck, uh, stuck around his neck, uh, then the best explanation here is that your dog is responsible for going through your trash. Uh. Just like inductive reasoning, this conclusion is based on a degree of certainty and not guaranteed. Uh. However, with this situation, it's extremely more likely that your dog is responsible than, say, your neighbor scattered your trash on the floor and put the lid around your dog's neck. While it's not impossible that your neighbor is responsible, it's very improbable. These three types of reasonings can also be used together. For example, you can start with an observation and draw the most likely conclusion based on your evidence using abductive reasoning. We know that abductive reasoning only yields a likely result, but it's not yet strong enough to become a theory, for example. So then, you can start experimenting with those results and gathering a lot of data. The more data you collect that continues to show the premises are true, the more degree of certainty you'll have in those premises. Then, perhaps if the data is extremely strong, you could even come to deductive reasoning which ensures perfect logical truth. I'll give an example of this for the flat earth argument in a few minutes. At this point though, I want to mention that in science, most experiments are made to try and prove theories wrong, not right. It's only when we find these gaps in our knowledge that we can find the reasons, explain them, and continue to expand our knowledge. Here's a quote from Albert Einstein that showcases how strong theories can become. He said, No amount of experimentation can ever prove me right, but a single experiment can prove me wrong. Even after 100 years of thousands of experiments trying to find a hole in his general and special theories of relativity, no one has been able to find one. Contrary to belief systems, science embraces the things we have yet to figure out because it's an opportunity to expand our horizons, so finding gaps in our knowledge is not something we're actively fighting against. Another thing that's asked very often by non-scientists is at which point do theories become facts or laws? This question in itself is very confusing. The first thing to note is that in science we start with a hypothesis and many experiments. Only after a hypothesis has been rigorously tested and we're unable to prove it wrong does it get the theory title. So contrary to what many people think, a theory is not just something we say and hope to be true. A theory is a king among all hypotheses. Now back to the main question. Imagine an orchestra with many instruments. Each of those instruments have notes to play. Each of those notes can come with nuances like being played softly, loudly, or increasingly fast or slow. Science in itself is a bit the same way. If, for example, we come up with a theory that's based on the knowledge we gained in 100 or even 1000 other theories, and it turns out that one of them is discovered to have a gap, it's extremely rare that we'll have to rebuild the entire symphony. It might be a nuance that, that, that's wrong, it might be a note 
uh, or an entire measure. It might be one instrument or even a whole set of these instruments. Huh? At that point, we'll have to examine how that gap affects our symphony, and then we'll either reintegrate that into our symphony once it's fixed, or simply leave it out altogether if we find that it's not completely necessary. Some people have a grudge against science because it's always changing, as if it's something that can't be counted on. But that's precisely why it's the opposite and is the thing that can most be counted on. If you're religious and read a Bible and it says something that's just plain wrong, not adjusting your thinking is only blocking or at least stunting your personal growth and your understanding of the things around you. Yes, science is constantly changing and evolving, but it doesn't mean it can't be counted on now because tomorrow will prove today wrong. It just means that our understanding tomorrow will be much better than our understanding today. People like in the Flat Earth Society keep insisting on the fact that science is made up and can be invalidated. Yes, it's made up or invented as we document our increasing understanding of reality, but we never skew observations of reality to make it try to fit our model like flat earthers do. We just continue tuning up our understanding bit by bit, and with the shape of the earth there's not much left at all to discover about its size, shape, and movements. Huh? Here's an example of all that we learned here using the flat earth argument again. First you start by examining that boats disappear bottom first across the horizon. Then you look at shadows from the sun in two different places on earth. Then you realize that the North Star is only visible from the northern hemisphere. This is abductive reasoning that uses observations to come to the most likely conclusion that earth is a spherical shape. With this information, we can now start using inductive reasoning to see if we can make it strong. If we can, great. If we can't, no big deal. We'll just continue through this process until we find good premises, which will become the base for our new knowledge. So here, we can take the hint we got from abductive reasoning, saying that the Earth is a sphere, to start gathering data that might be important to us. So here, we choose to start looking at all the celestial bodies we can. Now we realize that with our data, every planet, exoplanet, and all different types of stars are all spherical in shape. So with millions or billions of data points in our set, we can start forming the following hypothesis. All of the planets we've observed are spherical, Earth is a planet, therefore we expect Earth to be spherical. With this incredible amount of data, the result of this inductive reasoning is an incredibly strong, almost unarguable result. Unfortunately, we can't go further and turn this into a deductive argument for certainty because we would have to look at every single one of the septillion planets and every single one of the sextillion stars before we could ensure that the premise that all planets and stars are spherical is always true. Instead, what we can do here is adapt our premise to something we can guarantee to be true, like a fixed star overhead at the North Pole will be near the horizon at the equator and out of view from south of the equator on a spherical planet. From Earth, the North Star is directly overhead at the North Pole. From Earth, the North Star is near the horizon from anywhere at the equator. And from Earth, the North Star can't be seen from anywhere below the equator. Therefore, Earth is a spherical planet. Or here's another one that builds on previously gained geometry knowledge about the curvature of any sphere. A sphere of Earth's diameter should have about 8 inches of curvature per mile squared from any point on a leveled surface like water. Earth has an 8 inch curvature per mile squared on lakes or oceans. Therefore, Earth is a spherical planet. Since all of the premises are true, the conclusions are also true with certainty. There is no other reasonable shape that could satisfy all the premises for these examples. And this is only one example, but there are thousands upon thousands of deductive arguments like this that all yield the exact same undeniable result that the Earth is a spherical planet. And there you have it. We started with observations that gave us a good hint on what the next data was that we needed to gather. We explored the data to give us extremely strong evidence, uh, then finally ended up with deductive reasoning that is perfectly verifiable and true, and yields an absolute certainty that the result is also true. 
as you can see, all these ways of coming up with uh, hypotheses, adding premises, coming to conclusions, re-examining and our, adjusting our theories and our knowledge as new information comes in, and gradually going from weak to strong to certain evidence uh, are all based purely on logic and information gathering. No one is ever required to believe something without evidence uh, and everything is out there for anyone to research and learn. There is no secret. So in conclusion, science is not a belief, it is a process. Uh. If you like this video and want more content like this, please like and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions about what you'd like to talk about, put it down in the comments below or come follow me on Twitter or Facebook. Links are in the description. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.